All right, we are live, everybody. So uh, welcome to this awesome, awesome live stream. We've been super excited to have this for a while. Uh, some of you may know me. I'm the Vividen. Uh, <laughs> I, I make some YouTube videos sometimes uh, on this weird channel. Uh, so you might find it a little bit familiar. And we're going to have a very special guest star here today. John, would you mind introducing yourself? Yeah, well, my name is John Genuvis, and I'm a student of paleontology. And I've been fortunate enough to actually get to work in the field a little bit and do some fossil preparation and excavation over the past few years. So that about sums it up. Yeah. Super cool. So I think uh, we're going to go ahead and start with just like a little bit about about you as a paleontology fan, like how you got into it. Maybe there was like some childhood experience with a museum or something that kind of kickstarted it all. How did you get into that field? Like, like a lot of kids, I just kind of got into dinosaurs when I was little. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to go to every museum I could. I've heard, I've heard the story that an aunt read me a book about dinosaurs and I was hooked. And that was it. That's all it took. And uh, when I was like three or four, and I just wanted to go to muse every museum I could. Uh, when it comes to museums, I particularly love the Thanksgiving Point Natural History Museum oh. here in Utah. Yeah. Oh, that's my favorite. Yeah, it it was always my favorite as a kid. And I've got to go back to it this year. And um, I spent in a, 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 an hour in the trilobite room because mm -hmm. those are my favorites. That's kind of what I focus a lot of my uh, research on. And... Yeah, so much to my girlfriend's frustration, we had to stand in the trial by room for an entire hour while I just went from specimen to specimen, just pouring them over. And yeah, but that's a really cool museum if you're ever up in the Salt Lake area. It's kind of unique mm -hmm. as natural history museums go. And really, the layout is awesome. And oh, it's for anyone, fantastic. Yeah, for anyone in the chat, I guess, who wants to go out there, it's really cool. Yeah, yeah every, everybody who's in the chat, uh, comment if you can hear slash see us hopefully yeah. both just want to make sure this is working okay yeah that is that's honestly probably my favorite museum i've ever been to yeah, it's just i'm glad to hear that yeah yeah not a lot of people have actually been to it when it comes to the big mm -hmm. museums so it's yeah. it's the nostalgia by itself is incredible mm -hmm. and that yeah. place i love the models when you walk in and there's just this huge quetzalcoatlus mm -hmm. like right above your head yep. a torvosaurus right there growling at you they got rid of the torvosaurus what it's a gorgosaurus now oh really um, yeah wow. it's it's all casts i think it's one of there i think they're all gaston casts and um it's a really i can't remember the name of it but it's a it's a gorgosaurus with a lot of pathologies lots of healed broken oh bones. interesting just lived a brutal life but so I was kind of sad to see the Torvosaurus go, but the. But hey, that's cool, you know. More yeah, Tyrannosaurus. Like, yeah, more Tyrannosaurus. <laughs> Not yeah. gonna complain about that. Yeah. So, and uh, so as a kid, I just kept loving dinosaurs, mm -hmm. and it kind of went from that childhood interest and developed more into a scientific interest mm -hmm. over time, and that's what led me to kind of pursuing what I'm doing now. Yeah. That is super cool. Yeah. So oh, you mentioned, said, oh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh. Yeah, I said, yeah, someone said that their favorite museum is the AM and H and that was. I, I cannot I blame you. <laughs> yeah, I've only been I've, able to go. Uh, I've, never, I've never been, I want to go so bad. It is, I could, you, there's so much to see. You could spend days and days and days in there. It's too much almost. Oh man, but, just make it a, just make it a sleepover. I, you know, I wish they had like a connected hotel or something because. <sighs> They could use it. Maybe they do. I don't know. That would be so cool. Yeah, it's a spectacular museum. So oh, looks like we're experiencing some mild static there. On my side, or uh, I'm not sure where it's coming from. Do you hear it? I don't. Oh, okay, it's gone. Maybe it's coming from me. Hmm. Okay, looks like we're good. All right. So you mentioned that you kind of got into fossil preparation specifically, and that's a big yeah. part of, of your skill set. How did you like segue into that from like okay. the childhood experience to the more the scientific element of paleontology work? Everything was catalyzed by a single lab tour I took. Um, I heard that the um, Bureau of Land Management offices in Kanab, Utah had mm -hmm. a paleontology crew and they had like a, a prep lab 
and uh, a field program. And they, and I heard that if you go and ask for four, if they're around, they'll give you one. So I coordinated with them and I went up just to see the little lab tour and I got to meet all the people who work there and uh, the paleontologist in chief, I guess, Alan Titus, he seemed to notice that I was really interested and told me that they do internships. And that was that I applied and I got it. Um, and that was 2018. And I've had that position every summer since. And that, uh, the, what I learned from that, what I've learned through my whole time there is, you know, obviously get good grades. It's mm -hmm. you want to be going into the sciences, but just going out there and trying to make those connections is just as valuable, especially in kind of a tight field like paleontology. Like all I had to do was go and meet these people and show them that I was genuinely interested and that it went beyond just, oh, I like dinosaurs, but I had some knowledge of the science behind it and some knowledge of local geology and it paid off. So anyone who's interested in going into paleontology, that's my advice is try to just put yourself out there and try to form connections, even if you don't have any qualifications because it can pay off, um, but that's a tangent. Uh, so when they hired me, my, the work that I had to do was twofold and half of it was field work and half of it was lab work. And I really, really fell in love with cleaning up fossils and I've done it for them for the past few summers. And then last fall, I'd gotten to a point where I skilled enough that they extended the internship and I actually ran a lab here Wow! and I'm still running my own little lab because I fell in love with it so much that mm -hmm. I bought all the equipment, which is an in, quite an investment. And I'm still, I'm doing it for uh, that crew. And I do some stuff just for me and then some private contracting for collectors and stuff like that. Yeah. That is so, super cool. Yeah. And it's, it's no, it's a process. A lot of people don't think about when they see dinosaur bones in a museum, they just mm -hmm. see them in, you know, in Jurassic park. They're just sitting there brushing off these bones and the these gap, and fully formed cool, completely yeah. intact and it's never like that just even getting i spent weeks and weeks just putting together a turtle shell that was like that big around mm -hmm. it is really time intensive and really skill intensive to make dinosaur bones go from chunks of fossil in a rock to something presentable or useful for science and there's a lot of tools involved and a lot of time involved so but it's it's kind of artistic and for anyone who has patience mm -hmm. and kind of an artistic eye it can be really satisfying and that's why i fell in love with it so much so yeah that is super awesome it's like yeah. creating a, a biological puzzle it, it is it it's all like together there's a lot of that where you have to piece stuff together and just use the context of the little pieces you have to make everything fit and then just a lot of patience mm -hmm. yeah uh, in the lab i'm working in there's a Tyrannosaur skull that has been, and it's, it's the biggest one ever recovered from the monument. So the, the crew I worked with works in the grand staircase. That's called mm -hmm. the national monument. That's their jurisdiction. And there's a lot of Campanian age Cretaceous rocks of the Kaparowitz formation and the Wawi formation. And um, so anyone who knows the Tyrannosaurs, Lythronax and Tratophonius, yeah. we work with those. And we have a, um, there's a bone bed a Tyrannosaur bone bed out there where so far the, the minimum count is five individuals. So it's, it's a proper bone bed. And, um, anyway, so that, that's produced a lot. And of was that the Tratophonius bone bed that, that you guys described or yeah, published back published, in May? Yeah. yeah. The, uh, the rainbows and unicorns, quote, rainbows and unicorns. Is, is yeah. The actual technical name for the site. It's amazing. It's, uh, so five Tyrannosaurs, there's been a Dinosuchus a giant alligator that came out of there. That's at so least, cool. At least two hadrosaurs, but just mm -hmm. bits and pieces. About fifty turtles. It's a lot of everywhere. turtles. Lots of turtles. They're pi they're literally piled up on one another. And they're not just <laughs> little stream turtles. They're meter long, big. They're they're hefty turtles. boys. They are hefty <laughs> boys. And there's one particularly hefty one that is is mentioned in the publication. It hasn't actually been described yet. Mm -hmm. But it, it looks like Archelon. Wow. It looks, oh, it's not Archelon, but it's in that same family and it's okay. living in, well, it's mixed up in a Tyrannosaur bone bed. So we ran oxygen isotopes because oxygen isotopes can, in fossils can show you if they're living in 
um, seawater or river water mm -hmm. and it was living in the rivers so it was wow. this sea turtle that had gone back to the rivers and was living in these giant amazon sized river systems that were depositing the Kaparowitz formation that's really so, cool yeah the site is amazing and it's that been, is so awesome it's being excavated it's been excavated since 2014 uh -huh. it's still going and it's going to be going for another 100 years probably just because there's so much potential there's there so much yeah there's at the surface there's at least well it's getting close to an acre now of bone appearing it's everywhere. wow yeah so it's That's very incredible. extensive yeah the the story behind the site that dr titus was able to piece together is extensive and really cool and the paper is on ResearchGate, completely open access mm -hmm. so it's i don't i can't remember the full title it's a long scientific is it uh, geology and taphonomy of unique trinosaur bone bed? Yep, I've That's got it open one. right here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's it's really cool. That site is exceptional. But out of that site, we've got the largest teratophonia skull yet recovered from the Kaparowitz, and um, it's been in preparation for five years now. It's that time consuming for some of this preparation. Man, that's yeah. the that's like the eight point seven meter one, right? It's um there. That's how it would have been. Full length? Uh, full length? Oh, it was big. I don't know the exact length of... The skull is almost a meter exactly. And so, well, a little over a meter. And so it was getting to be medium large size Tyrannosaur. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. it, was, it was pretty big. It's getting pretty big. <laughs> so, and... Yeah, it's very... It's impressive to see. It doesn't look like a skull right now because it's on the lingual side, which is mm -hmm. the... Um, the inside not the pretty exterior it's the interior mm -hmm. so it doesn't look like anything recognizable but there's still the teeth coming out and it's pretty amazing that's really cool but yeah so a volunteer has been working on that for five years now and it's still wow. probably got another year to go so that's wow that's how much time goes into i mean he's there once or twice a week but still it's really time consuming to get these mm -hmm. fossils prepared so yeah, we we always we always hear about oh this this new thing was discovered and then we realize oh it was actually discovered you know 20, yeah. 25 years ago it just took this took this long to to dig it up and yeah and assemble it it's really such an impressive process yeah we uh the rainbows paper was almost kind of done prematurely because that site's not done yet but I mean a lot of the stuff that was published in the paper has been known since twenty fourteen mm -hmm. and or twenty fifteen and it just took the manuscript wasn't done till. Uh, I think it was late 2019 and then it took a couple of years to get through review. So mm -hmm. the scientific process, even beyond getting the fossils ready for description is very lengthy and oh, for sure. Yeah. Time consuming, but rewarding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The, the slog of academia is yeah, it's, exactly. it's worth it. Yeah. It's worth it. It, uh, it's, you always hear that the first draft of a scientific paper comes back just covered in you know red pen and uh -huh. it's it is they don't let you mess around at all nothing gets that's true passed, so that's yeah. true oh, yeah we've got a comment from jay i hope art and reconstructions of tyrannosaur cooperative hunting explodes once this gets more attention recognition and acknowledgement especially for the king t-rex yeah me too me too yeah well the site i mean there's plenty of sites with there's a few now that show tyrannosaur social behavior and mm -hmm. in some regard but this site is cool because it's it's got different age ranges because i know some of the alberta sore bone beds up in canada are just all adult individuals but this mm -hmm. one has growth stages from well one of the 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 bone that we have that tells us that there's at least five individuals is we have toe bones of five different size ranges that are all distinct so it has to have come from at least five different individuals but the smallest one of this particular toe bone is like this, and then the biggest one is like this. So it's quite quite a size range. <laughs> it's not hatchling to adult, but it's very young, mm -hmm. functional individual all the way up to full somatic adult. That's really cool. That's, That's cool. Yeah. it's so nice when you just have that like ontogenetic variety in a single mm -hmm. bone bed. It just it shows yeah. so much of the potential social dynamic that could have been there. Yeah, and um, all of the bones also show similar. Uh, compression and breakage patterns, which mm -hmm. says that this wasn't just a chance association. 
Um, these all died together in the same event. At the same they, time. Yeah, and something had to be bringing them together, and it's very unlikely it was just chance. So, yeah. That is super awesome. So it's it's another indicator for social behavior um, outside of just a single age mm -hmm. range. Yeah. So, and it's still got a lot to show. That site is still going to be excavated and prepared for a long, long time. There's a whole shipping container there just stacked full of jackets that are yet to be cracked open. And just, yeah, it's produced a lot of material. We started outsourcing some of the work to the University uh -huh. of Utah just because it's taking so long. It's because there's so much material to work with, right? Yeah, they've got the Dinosuchus right now. They're about oh, to it. man. Yeah, uh, they, they already have one, though. You know, they, they already got yeah. one in the in the Rio Tinto. Well, yeah, everything is uh, going to eventually, from this program, yeah. it's going to end up at the University of Utah. Eventually, mm -hmm. that's our repository. That, that's this. Okay. Yeah. But Honestly, anyway, I, I do love their museum, though. It's their, especially the new one. It's pretty darn cool. It's really cool. No trial of bites, but that's okay. You know, that that's that's where me. you come in, you know? Yeah. You're going to be their, their trial of bite contact. Well, maybe. Oh, it looks like another question. So T-Rex have skinny arms or bulky arms? Because I've been hearing about skinny arms and bulky arms. I mean, proportionally, they're small, but I don't know. If they're they're still been... pretty muscular. I think so. I've never remember, actually read any yeah. papers about the mechanics of Tyrannosaur arms. I remember there was a study back in 2014, I think, that basically just went through all the different muscle attachments and tried to figure out how much you could bicep curl. Oh, really? <laughs> and oh, it ended cool. up being close to about 500 pounds. Okay, yeah. So, so I mean, that's not powerful. bad for for a three foot arm. Yeah. That's that's quite it's quite strong. It is strange to think that a Tyrannosaur arm and my arm are about the same. Yeah, honestly. I, I certainly can't bicep curl, uh, you know, the Siberian tiger. No, no, I mean, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I would imagine they're fairly bulky if they were able mm -hmm. to mechanically pull that much weight. Yeah. What I function they serve, to be. who knows? Yeah. Further studies required. Yeah. We got one from Laggy Acris. How big of packs do you estimate for Tyrannosaurus? Um, well, the bone bed we're working has got the five individuals but that still could grow considerably. And I know some mm -hmm. of the Alberta, the Albertosaurus bone beds. Up in Dry Island? Yeah, that one has got, what, dozens of individuals? It's, I think the, yeah, I think the estimates were between like anywhere between 12 and 26, like yeah, that's a lot individuals. That's, that's a lot. So, but who knows if that was actually a, a hunting pack or some mm -hmm. other social behavior? Because I've heard it postulated that could have been a mating event. It was mm -hmm. all drawing them together. But it's so hard to tell. With it's really behavior. hard to tell, yeah. You can tell when they're being social, but you don't know why. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, oh, this this is a hard one to answer. I've had this discussion um, with some people I work with. And when it comes to tyrannosaurs, they're celerosaurs. So they have mm -hmm. fairly advanced brains when it comes to predatory dinosaurs, uh, just based on volume and some of the structures. Because when you look at an Allosaurus or a, a Giganotosaurus brain, they, they look like lizard brains. And then the closer you get to Celerosaurs, the more complex and bird-like in a way they get. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to tell exactly. Well, from what I've heard in discussions is it's really hard to gauge intelligence just from brain volume. Because especially when it comes to birds, they have really high neural densities. Um, which so volume isn't quite as much yeah. of an indicator as we would think. Yeah, but we don't know how close their brains were to actual mm -hmm. bird brains. or Because they're obviously something intermediate. They're not quite reptiles. They're not quite, quite birds. As derived as birds. Yeah. And so they're somewhere in the middle, and it's really hard to tell. But I would say that tyrannosaurs were definitely more intelligent than carnosaurs. Or, uh, but it's hard to say how far that intelligence went. It, uh, yeah. That's true. I mean, you know, encephalization quotient can only get you so far, mm -hmm. especially yeah. with how closely related they would be to birds. We've always, you know, we've always heard the, oh, you know, T-Rex was comparable to a crocodile, had the EQ mm -hmm. of an alligator or whatever, which honestly by itself is still, that's still pretty good. Yeah. There's, there's been tool use observed in, in mugger crocodiles and in alligators yeah, in Louisiana. I that a while back. That yeah. And cool. back in 2013, that was incredible. They will hunt down specific types of sticks and build traps for birds during the mating season wow. and I attack didn't know them. That far. They will, yeah, they will come out from under the water and build wow. rafts 
to lure the birds in since they're building those the nests with those types of sticks during the mating season. Yeah, that's pretty that's, smart. that's pretty smart. <laughs> yeah, that's frighteningly smart. It's frighteningly like. smart, especially yeah. because we often culturally we have this kind of perception as, you know, this is just because we're biased mammals of, mm -hmm. of reptiles is just being very slow, kind of, of dull witted. And yeah. really that's, that's not true. They're, they're quite, quite intelligent. Yeah. So yeah, I did not know that. That's really cool. But they it's, it's very cool. Yeah. So, wow. Wow. But the, the discussions I've heard are all focused on the point of, we don't know, we mm -hmm. know their brain structure and their brain volume, but we don't know how dense yeah the the um i mean how do we even calculate that from a fossil yeah. how do you, you how do you do it you can't you can't do it yeah yeah so but they were definitely smarter than a lot of other large predatory dinosaurs they're smarter than spinosaurs yeah. they're smarter than all the big allosaurs all the carcodontosaurs yeah, yeah. all right we got another one does pack size vary depending on genus i'm guessing I don't know if we have enough information to really answer that yet. Yeah, maybe in another 500 years of paleontology. <laughs> but yeah, Tyrannosaur bone beds are so hard to come by mm -hmm. now, and they're so hard to interpret that a lot of science, I've learned in paleontology, a lot of, um, when I ask questions, I very often get this from very, very yeah. well-trained PhDs. And there's just, it's all detective work, mm -hmm. millions and millions of years removed from the evidence. And so there's so much you just can't figure out. Yeah, it's true. And I, th I think that's something that's really cool about science is, you know, when people aren't afraid to say, I don't know, mm -hmm. because it is a process. That's the whole point of it is taking what you do know or what you think, you know, evaluating it and getting a new evidence, incorporating that into the system, trying to figure it out. So, you know, there's always that, that problem with the media of, Oh, you know, new study that, theorizes this potential thing mm -hmm. that, that always gets interpreted as this was this boom this was this every this science gets yeah. turned over upside down on its head yeah you no know, they're just just going yeah, for the next for paper views. comes out yeah. exactly exactly yeah. but it's really it's a much slower process science is an inherently slow and deliberate process which which it should be you know that's yes, a, the best be. way to incorporate information and to analyze what you have access to yeah So you know more about their social structure rather than just them being in packs or solo hunters or a pair of two mates. Um, when it comes to the social structures, it looks like they, at least from our bone bed, the rainbows and unicorns bone bed, it, it looks like maybe a family, maybe it's because you have a whole growth range, but it might mm -hmm. also just be a chance that they're just working together as they kind of ran into each other and formed a pack that's completely associated from genetics. It's, yeah, it's impossible to tell. Yeah, they're they're they've got their squad. <laughs> yeah, they've got a squad somehow. We just don't know how. If it's familial or if it's just forced together, kind of Hunger Games style, kind of hard to tell. Oh, growth rate questions. Fun. Could growth rate debunk a parental care of Tyrannosaurus? A friend of mine said the growth chart was too weird for there to be parental care. What are your thoughts? They do have a weird growth. Mm hmm. Because. Uh, they have that really slender form for the first few years and they just shoot up to these big bulky things. And when it comes to the ecology, it means that the, um, the young ones were probably faster and hunting completely different prey from the adults. And I've heard that postulate, I've heard it postulated that that's why there's almost no other big theropods around once the mm -hmm. tyrannosaurs roll in North America, because the range of morphologies they occupy throughout ontogeny is enough to fill in the whole predator ecosystem. Yep. The young ones are chasing the really fast, smaller stuff, and the big adults are just eating whatever they want. The big dinosaurs, <laughs> the big ceratopsids, they probably uh -huh. can't keep up with the ornithomimosaurs anymore. But it could, I, yeah, it would make pack hunting more difficult because the young ones would have a hard time going after the same things the adults are going. It's, after. it's true, yeah. So they might have just been hanging around. They could have been just opportunistic, yeah. yeah. Which, you know, makes sense. That's very energy efficient. Yeah. That's that's a really interesting point because I don't know if that's ever been extensively considered, especially with the site I worked at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, we're getting we're getting some solid questions. Yeah, really cool questions, yeah. 
Oh, here's another good one. Do you believe both of you that comparatively speaking as a genus, Tyrannosaurus were the most successful predatory dinosaurs? By the way, thanks for answering this smarter than I realized. I guess that, what do you mean by successful? Is my question. They did, they did do very well, especially in the late Cretaceous. They kind of took all of North America by storm. Mm -hmm. And the story there might get more interesting. This is just a little teaser of some research I've heard Ooh. recently. Uh, tra big tyrannosaurs might not have come from Asia. There might have been a back and forth interchange for several million years going back to further than the companion. So interesting. Yeah, there that story might get more complicated because it looks that way with the ankylosaurs. And some of the morphologies in the tyrannosaurs kind of look like, well, this trait evolved here and then it shows up in Asia hmm. and, show, and then a trait shows up there later and then it shows and up then it switches later. back. It's still tentative. Interesting. Um, but it's being discussed. So that's just a tangent. But um, yeah, I don't know if they were the... I think if they kept having time, the Tyrannosaurus would have continued to be very successful. They just were able to take over such a large mm -hmm. range of the ecosystem. They just... They filled so many predatory yeah. niches, yeah. They were very successful, but I mean... The ceratosaurs had been around, like fully developed ceratosaurs showed up in the middle Jurassic and they persisted all the way to the Maastrichtian, to the mm -hmm. KPG boundary. And so it's hard to quantify the su success. Yeah. Successful. Yeah. I mean, you could talk about like population dynamics with that study that just came out, mm -hmm. the 2.5 billion T Rexes yeah. that would have lived. But you can also talk about geographic range. You can yeah. talk about lifestyle, you know, where they, did they have fast food, you know? Yeah. Yeah. How, well, how they, sophisticated was, was this type of success? <laughs> yeah. Well, they had part of the, they had a lot of the Northern hemisphere under control, mm -hmm. but the South was still completely dominated by the Carcodontosaurs. And, 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 it's been really mm -hmm. interesting to, they must've started interacting in the late Cretaceous when you get the land bridges mm -hmm. showing up between North and South America and the Titanosaur interchanges, but that might be a different yeah. story too, because Another thing I've heard that is unpublished and just kind of whispered is tr titanosaurs completely disappear through almost the Cretaceous and North mm -hmm. America. They're in the Albion and the Aptian in the early Cretaceous, and then they vanish, and then they show back up in the Maastrichtian with Alamosaurus. Um, and there's just nothing except for one vertebra smack in the middle. I've heard there's one vertebra that's been found that might turn the whole idea that Alamosaurus came from South from America South America, head, they might have just been going somewhere where they were being fossilized because the middle and late Cretaceous parts of it were really, really, really hot. Mm -hmm. And they might have just gone up into the highlands and not and removed themselves from the fossil record. So that's still a really interesting story. That's I'm oh, that is to, yeah, I'm gonna have to keep tabs on that. That's really cool. Yeah. It hasn't been published yet, but that's out there. It's a, it's a floating idea to keep tabs on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's really, I think it's one of the most interesting little um, Cretaceous ecology mysteries that's still going mm -hmm. on. So. Especially, be, yeah, just like you said, they, if, if they take themselves out of the fossil record, mm -hmm. taphonomy just, just kills us every mm -hmm. time. Yeah. The, all the bones would be turned to powder before mm -hmm. they get to a place where they could be fossilized. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's the rough. That's the rough yeah. of it. Yeah. We'll never know what was living in the highlands when the dinosaurs were alive and that's sad mm -hmm. that is very sad yeah. could have been a bunch of scottish dinosaurs you know yeah we, <laughs> you know, with kilts and up in the highlands yeah it's we've got no idea there yeah. might have been mammals up there even taking over that ecosystem who knows it's, who knows yeah no way to know oh this is an interesting question uh, would there be possibilities of cannibalism between Tyrannosaurus from one pack to kill one another from another pack, if necessary, to feed their young slash friends? I don't see why not. I mean, they obviously, you get so many bite marks on faces mm -hmm. of Tyrannosaurus. The craniofacial biting. Yeah, exactly. They weren't always getting along, but that could reflect some behavior. Who knows what? I don't know if there's actually been any Tyrannosaur fossils with definitive... Um, cannibalism markings, like post mortem bites hmm. from other tyrannosaurs. I don't know. I don't know either. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna write that down. I'm gonna have to look yeah. that up later because I feel like I've heard about it, mm -hmm. Me too. but you know, just hearsay isn't enough to build a thesis. Yeah, 
I know that the abelosaurs were doing it, but mm -hmm. I don't know about the tyrannosaurs. That could be a fun topic for a future video, in all honesty. Yeah, that would be really cool. Tyrannosaur cannibalism. Mm hmm all right. Oh, we got another Titanosaur question. Do you think Southern population of Tyrannosaurus would have had slightly different tactics than the Northern population since the Southern population coexisted with Alamosaurus? Maybe. Um, it looks, they all look the same. There is some argument for speciation, but that's still even within the Hell Creek itself. So I don't know. Uh, they might've just been so bulky and generalized they, big tyrannosaurs didn't appear to be specialized at all, but they were probably, they probably saw the um, mm -hmm. big titanosaurs and just went, well, we'll try that out. <laughs> yeah. We'll give that a shot. Try yeah. the samples. Yeah. But uh, before T-Rex shows up, there are different morphologies in tyrannosaurs mm -hmm. in the north and the south. Because the further north you go, the um, ceratopsids change, the hadrosaurs change, and you... Up north, there's a lot more of the Albertosaurus, Gorgosaurus, these skinnier, more slender Tyrannosaurus. And then down south in Utah, we've only got stuff like Lythronax and Tratophonius, mm -hmm. which already look like a T-Rex. They're really bulky. They're these big bruiser They're more robust. Yeah. yeah. Bruiser. Yeah, that's a good term for it. <laughs> I heard that somewhere and it's always stuck with me. But there's something there that was driving two different morphologies in the Tyrannosaurus. But when T-Rex kind of got its heels in and just took over the whole from strictly North America, that dynamic seems to have disappeared. Yeah, I mean, that that makes sense. You know, something, an animal like T-Rex just kind of changes everything around it. Yeah, it was, it was a whole, yeah, ecological turnover when it showed up. Yeah, whole new yeah. ball game. Yeah, whole new ball game. But we got a convergent evolution question. Love those. Uh, you speculate. Love, yeah. oh, they're so much fun. Uh, if you survive the KPG mass extinction, transform morphology would convergently evolve itself in other predatory species. Probably referring to just the bulkiness, the yeah. cranial domination. I'm guessing. Yeah. Um, maybe if if the same prey showed up, like if the ceratopsids came to dominate in the southern hemisphere mm -hmm. and the hadrosaurs just kind of got more widespread, then if all the big carnosaurs survived. The interchange with the tyrannosaurs they might have started <laughs> to take on the same i don't know oh, that just, gone, just but, just yeah. imagining that just yeah. gives me chills a little bit how cool yeah. that would be i if it's true that there was a land bridge allowing titanosaurs through i bet it happened where you had big tyrannosaurs you know button heads with the with the carcodontosaurus yeah the, yeah and i that would have been interesting that would have been really really yeah. cool <laughs> yeah but I can see convergent evolution happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly makes sense. I mean, if it happened, that sort of bow plan happened multiple times within tyrannosaurs. Mm -hmm. I don't see why it wouldn't happen within another theropod group that was yeah. dealing with similar prey. I mean, they're already kind of going the same way. Mm -hmm. Get gigantic, get huge skulls. You don't need the arms as much. Reduce those. Almost every big theropod group in the late Cretaceous has got little arms. It's true. The Carnotosaurus, the tyrannosaurs, even. I mean, the, the abelosaurids are yeah, just. They're just They've got little fingers. Existing. Yeah. Just not even arms anymore. They're just like sausages. Whale legs, yeah. So this is, I guess, less of a question, just more of a paleontological appreciation moment. Imagine art of a group of T-Rexes fighting and brutally face fighting another group of T-Rexes over carcasses of multiple Triceratops herd members that were killed by one of the T-Rex groups. Someone needs to get on that. And imagine like lightning and a stormy night and said T-Rex versus T-Rex art. That'd be cool. Yeah. That'd be very Who cool. Who would be good for that? We could get, we could get Fred the Dinosaur Man on it. Is that a, is that is, a paleo uh, artist you have on yeah, the Yeah, oh, his stuff is fantastic. Oh, cool. I like to see the new paleo artist showing up. There's so many well-established so, names, but it's fun honest, when new people it's, It is cool. Yeah. It's very cool. I don't remember who the paleo artist was that did the... It was the La Ramendi and Molina Perez, like their theropod book that came out in 2019. Oh, yeah. I can't remember who the artist was for that, but it was fantastic. Yeah, I really I love the art in that yeah. book. Uh, there's the the big Indian um, abelosaur. 
I can't remember. It's one of the oh, really big ones, but the, uh -huh. the illustration of that one, the red and the yellow. Yeah. Oh, it's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the art in that book was fantastic. It's fantastic. I still have to get my hands on the Sauropod edition. I didn't know that was I've, out. I've heard. Yeah. It came out last year. I think it's, wow. it's, it's a new one, but I've heard it's amazing. It. It's I pretty updated that, too. Like they've got Marapunisaurus in it and everything. Like wow. it's up to date, way yeah. up to date. Yeah. Wow. Oh, looks okay. Looks like King of the Gojiras has posted this question a couple times. Uh, how suggested of a wolf like pack structure is the presence of multiple individuals of multiple ages and sizes? Uh, for example, Rainbow Unicorn Sight. Again, it's it's really hard to tell because, but well, I don't know much about wolf pack structure, so I don't, yeah, neither do I. That, yeah, <laughs> I don't really know if I can compare. Do you mean like an alpha and omega kind of as far as social dominance goes? That would be really interesting to theorize yeah. about. I don't know if there's that's even reflected in any uh, there's not many social even bird groups i, I don't know if, i can't think groups. of any bird groups that do anything like that no i know there's some a few hawks that hunt in like trios or pairs mm -hmm. yeah it's really hard to tell there's some social structure probably going on something you just don't know what something in in, in some capacity <laughs> yeah in some capacity they were living together Take this out to see right size to be able to attack and kill juvenile Tarbosaurus. Well, I mean, you know, if, if you're opportunistic, might as well go for it. Yeah. I mean, if the young Tarbos if Tarbosaurus follows other Tyrannosaur growth trends and they're young, we're probably going to look like Alioramus. So they would probably be competing over the same mm -hmm. ecospace and with one another. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's interesting that the Alioramids never show up in North America. Yeah, that's that's true. I mean, skull wise, especially, they were definitely a lot skinnier than they were a lot less derived. Yeah, a lot less derived. So maybe they just wouldn't have been able to really compete with some of the bulkier dinosaurs that showed up in North America. I've heard it speculated that Albertosaurus and Gorgosaurus were derived daily remains. They were a different lineage outside of the kind of T Rex lineage. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if anyone's actually done the phylogeny for that right yeah so mm -hmm. i've heard it speculated uh, there's a lot of speculations when it comes to tra when it comes to tyrannosaurs because everyone true. likes because uh, yeah everybody likes tyrannosaurus who, yeah. I, don't, I don't know anybody who doesn't oh if Jurassic park are real i know this is gonna be really nerdy but stay with me what would you want as the perfect tyrannosaur species to come back to life let's say as a first try so assuming that everything is perfectly successful mm -hmm. I mean, how can I say anything other than T-Rex? <laughs> yeah, T-Rex is... Well, let's say T-Rex is a given by Jurassic Park rules. So what, 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 would, be the, what would be the second? Yeah. I oh, I love Lithernax so much. But Lithernax is cool. So cool. Yeah. It's so yeah. sleek. It's like... There's still, well, there's some people arguing about what its morphology really was because the skull was fairly crushed. Oh, yeah? Um, I've actually got to go to the original quarry that it came out of. And um, that so doesn't, cool. yeah, that, that that doesn't have anything to do with the actual specimen, but it was life and is cool, and it has a really cool. It's cool how derived it is, and mm -hmm. bulky and advanced looking it is, despite being so young. Compared yeah, it's to it's like a dinosaurs. it's like a T Rex in miniature, just some exactly. like a shrink it ray, and just a lot like T Rex. It's very very similar. It might have been a predecessor to Tarbosaurus, maybe. Oh, that'd be interesting. Yeah. It looks like just Joshua. I'm partial to Despletosaurus, but that's just me. That's a solid pick. I mean, Despletosaurus is awesome. Yeah. Super cool. I don't know why I like it so much, but it's just so likable. It's, it is. It's very charismatic. Yeah. yeah. So is the 0.95 to 0.99 specific gravity only for mega theropods or all theropods? Um, so my recollection, this was so this is from uh, La Remende del 2020, where he and Gregory S. Paul and a bunch of other guys got together and recalculated specific gravity for theropods remembering off the top of my head i don't remember a whole lot of small theropods being covered in this study uh there definitely were a bunch that weren't mega theropods they were below the 5,000 kilogram mark but uh i would i would have to look back at the paper to look at everything that they covered but most most of them were not mega theropods that they covered i find it weird that albertosaurus went extinct around the same time tyrannosaurus appeared which is weird in my opinion yeah, it probably got pushed out of its mm -hmm. niche by the juveniles. 
Yeah. Maybe. Juveniles protected by adults, possibly. Yeah. You know, when you've got that muscle backing you up, it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were obviously hanging out with the adults. If so, Tyrannosaurus is pretty much the perfect Tyrannosaurus. <laughs> it is. It's perfect. It, it is. Yeah. It's just ev everything about it. I've heard um, there's people, I'm sure people know this, but there's an the argument that there's three different species of T-Rex, not just T-Rex, matching kind of the three different... Um, Localities? Well, it's uh, no, it's the same locality, it's just time. So you get the whole progression from um, like... Digimoloc to Dracorex to mm -hmm. Pachycephalosaurus, and that doesn't look to just be ontogenetic. It looks like it's those were distinct species throughout time. It actually, that's actually drift. Yeah, yeah. and uh, it looks like there might have been three morphotypes of T. Rex matching those three bands. Interesting. Maybe. Yeah, I hear a lot of hearsay and speculation uh -huh. in some of the Tyrannosaur researchers I've got to know, and I obviously can't even engage in their conversations. I would just sit back and at the campfire and with some know, popcorn. <laughs> yeah. It was always just, it was cool to hear all these whisperings of mm -hmm. stuff that's not on the internet, not really published. Very cool. But there's a, a lot behind of, the scenes. Look, there's a lot of really cool research coming about Tyrannosaurus. Yeah. Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> yeah. I wonder, yeah. Would there be enough of a skeletal difference between those individuals to justify three different species? It's almost all in the skulls. There seems to be three different morphotypes mm -hmm. of the T-Rex skull. And it has to do with some of the bosses and horns around the eyes. And there's, there is kind of three groupings you can force them into. I don't know if anyone's collaborated the three um, groupings with time periods or. That would be interesting to cross reference. Things. Yeah. There's a lot of cool stuff that needs to be cross brush yeah, because remember jack corner was talking about like tyrannosaurus x a while back i don't know if that went anywhere mm -hmm. it's i think it's connected to those mm -hmm. ceratops someone mentioned ceratopsipes oh where oh, i missed the comment where to go oh yeah right here yeah and this is off topic yeah i mean i don't see why not <laughs> yeah isn't uh, that the giant footprint that's i that sounds familiar yeah, I, yeah the giant ceratopsian footprint yeah i've heard whisperings that there's um a ceratops of his print that is suggests a colossal something like like 18 tons or something yeah it was he was ridiculous absurd yeah sauropod size ceratopsian yeah i've seen that's one of those fun paleontology things i've seen bouncing around but no one has mm -hmm. ever seemed to actually pursue it yeah i'll i'll look into that hopefully it doesn't end up like bruhath chaosaurus <laughs> yeah yeah just another big fish story Big fish getting lost in a drawer. Yeah. Yeah, the coolies. Yeah, that would, that would be really fun to look into, though. Yeah. Oh. Just reading the comments. T Rex isn't just the perfect dinosaur, it's literally the perfect animal in general. <laughs> Well, it was successful. It was it was very very successful. Well, I'm sorry if I started a war, but our Titanosaur is the real king of the dinosaurs. Although Tyrannosaurus Rex has king in its name, but would a very crazy T Rex kill T Rex? I mean, Titanosaurs are slow. I mean, Titanosaurs when it comes to if you're judging king by mass, yeah, they win. Yeah, definitely. Because they're they're fighting with the whales for the largest mm -hmm. animals ever. Yeah, titanosaurs are pretty spectacular. They're I want to know how they may t maintain that size. So consistently. The amount, yeah, the amount of food that they would, especially when you look in the Morrison, where you've got like a dozen different sauropods. I mean, those are partial in time, but still at any given time, you've got four or five big, really big mm -hmm. sauropods all fighting for resources in a semi-arid environment i don't know how they were all surviving and getting that big yeah even just ecologically yeah it's that's crazy yeah because the morrison was only had enough food to sustain a diverse ecosystem for half the year and then it had a dry period i just maybe they were going elsewhere but it's just amazing that they were able to maintain that biomass mm -hmm. i've heard people once again insulation behind those doors but there's some ideas that 
big sauropods might have gone through different kind of I forget the term, but might have fluctuated between like mesotherm, endotherm, ectotherm, where they might have spent their younger years more warm blooded, I guess, mm -hmm. just eating as much as they can, accumulating biomass. And once they get super big, they shut down and go more cold blooded and just, and rely just really on gigantothermy. Their... Exactly, on gigantothermy to kind of maintain themselves, at least their at least their body heat and then just maintaining the size through eating. But mm -hmm. yeah, there's some, they had to have some interesting evolutionary development to be able to get that big and be on land and share ecosystems with other big sauropods. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. There's just, there's so much, there's so much to think about and there's it, so much to study that we just don't know. Yeah. That's part of the fun is, is the not knowing and the thinking and the you know, findings, coming up with all yeah. these different explanations. Yeah. And then, and then finding things to either support or, or don't support. And you're like, man, I got to start over or I get to keep moving forward. Like, let's go. Yeah. Every new site is exciting because the potential is just incredible. Mm -hmm. When you find a bone coming out of the ground and it turns into something, there might be some contribution to science there. You just never know. Exactly. That's one of the, yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's just, you know, you never know what you're going to find. Yeah. It's always crazy hitting this. I oh, don't want to stereotype them as just killing machines, but this question has honestly been one of my favorites to ask. Uh, minus T-Rex, what Tyrannosaur would you say would win if they all fought? So I'm assuming that's one individual of each species altogether, like Battle Royale style. I mean, Despletosaurus, Tarbosaurus, and Zhushang Tyrannus are all about the same. Yeah. I think th those would be yeah, the most even. Those three would be the, the biggest contenders, I would say. Yeah, Despletosaurus particularly was really heavily built, mm -hmm. but... As far as mass goes, yeah. they're all in the same. They're all really close. General yeah. area. It could be, yeah, probably any one of those three. I don't know which one is the most combat derived. I guess yeah. <laughs> they were all doing pretty well for themselves. They, yeah, they were for sure. Okay, a guy I talked with had an idea about T. Rex females making a lot of babies and juveniles to the hunting as females use them for easier food in exchange to protect the juveniles. That is an interesting idea. I don't know if there's any way to. To verify that yeah that would be really really hard to it's a very specific got, social strategy that be difficult can, to find yeah unless you get a bone bed where all the adults have medullary bone it would be almost every, every, single every single one every single no, one we yeah, just have like six b-rexes yeah that right be, next to each other it'd be exciting that would be very very exciting feel like I have to come back to the parental growth, so I don't think it would debunk parental care because it's very likely the juveniles wouldn't have strayed far from the adults. What do you think? Yeah, well, it depends on... Oh, that's so complicated. It depends on if they were afraid of the adults. But I, so many, I, at least a couple of the bone beds suggest they were young living with adults. So, let me read that again. You want me to pull that back up? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Yeah, at least in some capacity, the juveniles are staying close to the adults. Um, yeah. But it's hard to tell what that dynamic was, whether they yeah, were... Yeah, what, what staying close means. Yeah, whether they were profiting off of the juveniles' kills or vice versa. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, let's see. I guess this kind of comes back to a little bit of the topic we were talking about earlier, but do you think that dinosaurs can be smarter than we think? Yeah. I think there's a good chance that if dinosaur brains, if, if bird brains are a plesiomorphic character, if they're coming way, it's a trait that's coming from way, way back in dinosaur evolution, then it's very possible that all dinosaurs had brains with high neural density mm -hmm. and for their size, they were disproportionately intelligent because that's how birds are they have little brains relative to their body mass but the neural but they, they can be really very high. very smart just look at ravens and crows exactly it allows them to be smart with a small brain because mm -hmm. they've packed so much um so many neurons in there and so if dinosaurs were doing the same thing yeah they were definitely smarter than we are giving them credit for for just their brain volume. yeah 
And honestly, I feel like humans in general kind of have a tendency to underestimate the intellectual capacity of animals. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't you even know. know that crocodiles could build traps. I know it's it's incredible. I think I think it's only been observed in the mugger crocodiles and in uh, American crocodiles in uh, like Louisiana and, and Texas. Wow. I got to uh, read about that. That's so cool. It's very very cool. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. There's another. Yeah, I say most likely to be honest, we're known to downplay animal intelligence. Yep, especially reptiles. One hundred percent true. Okay, so we've been going for almost an hour now. Uh, it's wow. probably going to be time that passed really quickly. <laughs> yeah, it did. Yeah. So let's say we can probably keep going for another ten minutes or so. We don't want to. Yeah, sure, as long as you want, really. Keep anybody too long, but so everybody can think of your most bestest questions. <laughs> And uh, John was mentioning earlier, uh, you know, he is a massive uh, paleontology fan, but he's also quite versed in uh, other nerdy matters. So we can uh, go on tangents if we need to. You know, if anyone likes to... trilobites, 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 or what's up? Trilobites. Oh, a good friend and I agree that Tyrannosaurus, if compared to as a genus to modern-day lizards, would be the monitor lizards of the reptile world. Another friend says tegus. Who would you guys agree with? I'm poorly versed in hmm. reptiles. That's interesting. I mean, monitor lizards would definitely be more accurate as far as size-wise goes. You know, monitor the biggest monitor lizards like Komodo dragons and Asian water monitors get considerably larger than the biggest tegus. But tegus are also very intelligent, so that kind of goes yeah. into that conversation we just barely had about potential neural density and, and tool use and everything. Tegus are incredibly smart. Yeah, uh, they they can uh, you can clicker train them. You can teach them come to their name. Basically, you can teach tegus to do what dogs can. Biologically, they're a little more constrained. They're not as flexible. Yeah. You know, they're still lizards, but they're they're very very intelligent. Well, aren't they omnivores too? Yeah, tegus are omnivores. So that kind of pushes them mm -hmm. away from yeah monitor lizards. At least when it comes to diet and ecology, mm -hmm. monitor monitor lizards would be better. Are def so. definitely more similar. Yeah, I think and when it comes to the dinosaur intelligence, the raptors were still winning. The raptors. The raptors, yeah. Not not the troodontids? Well, I guess I've grouped them in there. But yeah, the troodontids mm -hmm. and the just dinonychosaurs in general were mm -hmm. smart. Very, very smart. Um, oh, could there have been difference in the appearance of Tyrannosaurus because of where they come from, for example, north or south? So I guess that kind of ties into the three different bands you were talking about, but based off mm -hmm. of location rather than time. Yeah. And then the different morphotypes before T-Rex took over. With the mm -hmm. northern tyrannosaurs tending to be more slender and then the southern ones being more bulky but that might just be have to do with prey not with latitude mm -hmm. yeah yeah i feel like that makes sense yeah there's interesting correlate possible correlations of ceratopsid morphology with latitude especially frill size and how it, it may have oh that makes a lot of sense especially if it's blood regulation yeah yeah, yeah, because if you look up north, you got all these centrosaurs with these small round frills mm -hmm. and these relatively shorter horns. Um, at least in the Campanian when it was really hot, and then when you get down south, you get these big pentaceratops with these gigantic frills, and more crazy centrosaurs and chasmosaurs like Cosmoceratops, which have got you know all these crazy like folds. And I've got to um, for anyone who's a ceratopsid fan, I've worked. With I've worked very closely with the um, namesakes for Nasutoceratops and Cosmoceratops. Oh, My boss nice. was, because um, Nasutoceratops is Nasutoceratops Titusi, and Dr. Mm -hmm. Titus was my boss. And he's, shout out to Dr. Titus for being one of the coolest on the planet. And then, and then Cosmoceratops is Cosmoceratops Richardson and I. I got to work with Scott Richardson quite a bit. Oh, that's very cool. He actually found Cosmoceratops, the first one, yeah. So it's cool that there's um, I always thought that the, the people that dinosaurs get named after were always like inaccessibly high in academia, but a lot of them are just the paleontologists doing the boots on the ground yep. work in their own. They, they don't have to be at huge museums. They're all playing really important parts. And mm -hmm. Not everyone needs to be a Paul Serino to be doing a big part in paleontology and making really big contributions. Yeah. You don't, you don't have to be in the cover of national geographic or win the no. sexiest man alive contest. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. He's done both. 
Did he really? Paul Serino? He did, yeah. He was in the... <laughs> I didn't know that. I, think, I was reading the Wikipedia article on him like five or six years ago for a report in school. And apparently he like he was in National Geographic's like list of 100 sexiest men alive. I just thought that was so funny. You know, paleontology, man. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> oh, it looks like we've got a, a, a question in direct messages from Pokesaurus. Uh, what does John think about Nano Tyrannus? hunting in packs so that's opening a, that's opening a can of worms right there that is opening a can of worms there are there are whisperings of the third finger on some specimens uh, really whisperings i don't know if it's true but the the debate is still very active and alive and every time the paper comes out that says oh this kills nanotyrannus or this makes nanotyrannus might be settled soon um Especially with the dueling dinosaurs finally getting into the hands of science. Oh, thank goodness. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That was a pretty cool win. And um, I think the dueling dinosaurs, Tyrannosaur, will settle that debate. But I think Nanotyrannosaur, uh, Nanotyrannus has a fighting chance still. I don't know. There's, it might it might not be, but it, it might be a there, little bit. There's a chance. There's a possibility. There's a chance still. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. Oh man, that's that's exciting. Could go either it, way still. It could still go either way. That's I do think some of the nanotyrannus are juvenile tyrannosaurs, mm -hmm. but some of the other ones maybe not. So we'll see. Well yeah, we'll see we'll see where that goes. The dueling dinosaur stuff, knowing I mean it was all prepared already. Um mm -hmm. and that takes a lot of the time out. So I imagine that'll get a publication in a few years and then we'll know. I hope so. so that should be a cool one soon. I'm still waiting for a f official description of Trix. Trix. She, Trix, the, the giant uh, Tyrannosaur, or giant T-Rex that's been on tour in the Netherlands for like the past five years. How did I miss that? I haven't heard it's of a, It's a Sioux-sized individual. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, when, when they, they uncovered her, I think in the night, sometime in the 90s, but she wasn't on display until 2016. And then there was this huge press buzz of another Sioux-sized, almost Scotty-sized animal but we wow. still have never gotten a description huh. of of the individual it's yeah. so complete it's it's yeah. an absolutely beautiful specimen i don't know why they haven't described it it's been yeah. well is it just is it uh, in private hands uh i'm not sure i don't know if the museum owns it or if they were just okay borrowing it because well i know stan is now in in a private collection but he got researched, and there's so yeah. many tyrannosaurs. That's there, and there are so many casts of Stan too. There's like yeah. 50 of them. There's stands everywhere. I actually got to meet the guy who, uh, um, I went to the Tucson Rock and Mineral Show because uh, I wanted to get unprepared trial bites from Morocco. I actually got to meet the guy who sold Stan. Oh, and you know no what? No way. He's in the, he's a uh, he's not evil. <laughs> he's just, okay. He's actually a pretty cool guy. He's That's just, good. <laughs> it's just business. Yeah. That's true. That's true. Money's money. Yeah. Would you agree that it is mainly pop culture that makes Tyrannosaurs appealing to most people, or do you think that they were destined to be popular? Thanks for answering all my questions, by the way. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, in order to become popular in pop culture, it's got to be for a reason, you know? I mean, Michael Crichton picked T-Rex in Jurassic Park mm -hmm. because of, partially because of how popular it already was, but partially because of how terrifying of an animal it yeah. is. Well, it's T-Rex is so cool. because It's, it's so cool. cool it's such an impressive animal and it's just so well represented in the fossil mm -hmm. record. You almost never get that. Exactly. Think, Espe especially think, for an apex predator. Yeah. I think T-Rex can owe its popularity to the fact that it got preserved mm -hmm. so often and so well. And I think if, if there were, you know, Giganotosaurus all over South America and that being found for decades and with that level of preservation, they would have won. I guess North America got researched first. T Rex was really well represented in the fossil mm -hmm. record, so it, it just the it just concept. has that, yeah. And then there's just there's just so much that T Rex does well. You know, it's not only ar arguably the most massive mm -hmm. uh, theropod by a considerable margin, but there you know there was that uh, intelligence bonus that it had as as part of being so derived. There yeah. was the its senses were incredible. I remember that study that Dr. Bacher came out with a few years ago about its hearing, how it had the same same level of hearing of as a like a snowy owl, basically. Whoa. Yeah. yeah. That was 2015, 2016, I want to say. I don't want to know how he's quantifying that. I'm gonna write that down. Yeah. I don't know how you'd tell, but that's really 
It's, it's nice. really cool. And then the sense of smell obviously was incredible. Yeah, All factory right. notes were absolutely gigantic. Great binocular vision and everything. So T-Rex is definitely more massive than Spinosaurus now. Did you see that they also, Spinosaurus has been redone again? Again, yeah. Again, if I have to hear about Spinosaurus one more time. <laughs> I yeah, think it, I mean, I think bas it. basically, with with the recent studies that have been coming out and all the new GDIs and everything that have been done, uh, I mean, Ibrahim's their uh, their 2020 Spinosaurus volumetric model, the rib cage was a little like artificially inflated. They made it significant. They made it deeper than the pelvic girdle, which was hmm. a little little odd. But uh, yeah, okay, even change again. I'm sure it's going to change again. Ibrahim, he's just, he's holding as much as he can close to his chest. I, he's trying to I make as many so. studies as he's, he can. It's I a career it's, move. That's what it, it is. is. It's a smart career move. It is very smart. I'm just going to like, I want to just block Spinosaurus for a decade <laughs> and then finally and see it again. And be like, oh, okay. It's finally. Oh, it has wings now. Uh -huh. Yeah. Oh, it's got wings. Uh -huh. It's breathing fire. It's breathing fire. It, it was in Caligon the Black. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I never made it through the Silmarillion. Oh, it's so good. It's it's definitely a a, a different read, for sure. Everything. Totally different vibe. Yeah. From Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit. The Hobbit, you know, it's just very fun. It's a quick read. You know, you pound that out in a couple hours. Lord of the Rings is much more dense. Silmarillion is like reading the Old Testament. Like. Yes, it is. It's, it's exactly just it's more of an stuff. anthology kind of. The stories do tie together, but not nearly as as fluidly. Yeah as in Lord of the Rings, because yeah, it's not just one story. It covers like 40,000 years of history. I bet I could get through it now. I just never had yeah. the attention span as a kid. That's that's fair. Yeah, I had that's just fair. enough of a span to get through the Lord of the Rings books, and then uh -huh. I couldn't do this in the early. Yeah, I, I think if you tried it again, you'd probably really enjoy it. It's got I some really, really cool stuff in there. Yeah, if I can get through Melville. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Someone mentioned... Trial by research. I'm going to sing. Oh, trial by research. Yeah. Because there is new, there's always new research on trial bites. Yeah. Um, always there's new research on trial bites. There's always cool new ones cropping up in China, mostly. But there have been some new sites in Canada and even in the US. I think there's a new site in Arkansas of all places. Really? That's yeah. unexpected. The one place that I think they're hiding out is Nevada. Oh, so that Nevada, makes sense. Nevada was never well surveyed. I personally know of two undescribed trilobite faunas in um in Nevada. In Nevada. Yeah, that are one is um I'll just say it's close proximity to a uh, an Air Force installation makes it difficult to get to. That's um, understandable. <laughs> a very famous Air Force installation and but it's a lower there's a lower Cambrian assemblage out there that is totally undescribed and really cool just from an aesthetic viewpoint they're very pretty and then there's very impressive devonian ones in nevada that only as far as i know have been taken by collectors and it is a whole new it's similar to the devonian stuff you get in morocco or oklahoma mm -hmm. it's really impressive spiny trilobites but they're a whole different thing they're totally unlike those faunas it must have been a different ecosystem but there's stuff out there that's never been seen before just and producing totally are, out of this world varieties. Yeah, there's um, there's a giant, there's a giant trial bite from there, but I, I actually can't talk about it too much. But it's in a family where they usually don't get large, and this one is freakishly large and freakishly ornamented. Interesting. F for the family, it's only getting. I mean, still big trial bites. That's, that's still that's still a big trial bite. Yeah. It's unusually large for the family. It's got these big horns that look like a samurai helmet. It's cool. Yeah. what <laughs> yeah it, it it looks exactly like a samurai helmet that is so awesome it's um as far as i know it's never entered the hands of science so yeah I'm a well, i mean when that when that gets described that's just begging to become a paleo meme yeah it's gonna i'm gonna maybe i can get one but i've heard the rock is brutally hard to work oh yeah yeah and it's just like glass and will shatter but anyways yeah i can see how they make things difficult yeah Ooh, ceratopsian question. That's something I actually do not know a lot about. They definitely had quills and feathers, at least mm -hmm. the small ones. I think the, the jury's still out on the big ones. Um, I don't know if they'd need it. Well, what about that skin impression with, uh, oh, what was its face? Samson, the, the triceratops they have at the Houston Museum of Natural History. 
I, so I, I went there a couple of years ago and I saw the indentations in the in the skin impressions that they had from that individual. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if they were mm -hmm. ornamented with that stuff. And I wouldn't be surprised if proto feathers went really far back into yeah. um, to um in Kuratarsi when you get back into the shared ancestors of um dinosaurs and pterosaurs. Mm -hmm. I since those both though both of those lineages show kind of proto feathers, I wouldn't be surprised if that if, if it went back dates back that far to that common ancestor. Yeah. I feel like that would make sense. Faro tribe. <laughs> I'm not, I don't know. I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> oh, okay. This is the one I, I meant to click on. How good is the evidence for social behavior in Despletosaurus specifically? I as far know. as I'm aware, I think I only know of one monodominant bone bed for Despletosaurus, and there were only two individuals. I think that was yeah. in the two, two medicine formation. That's the I, only one I know of. Yeah. Oh, I do know the one. And yeah, I don't know what it says. I should read up on that. Yeah, on oh, me too. <laughs> yeah, yeah I just have I just have this heads. notebook full of notes from like all these things from the talk about on the stream that I need to go look up and identify and figure out. Yeah, for working with transfer bone beds, I should know them better. You know, there's. But I I haven't done any of the real science. I'm really just a. Uh, my value to the program was mostly just uh, labor. Hey, that that's valuable. <laughs> that's what I like to do. So, just getting to yeah. bask in the in the glory of of the rock. Yeah, they're no good till they're in a lab. So someone's got to yeah. yank them out of the ground. Exactly. Yeah, that's a that's a crucial part of the process. That's it's super a lot important. of work. It is a lot of work to make those jackets and flip those jackets and get them out of there. We need a helicopter mm -hmm. most of the time. But, yeah. Yeah. We my, my last week out there, we got a, a perfect turtle. It was a Neuronchylus meter long turtle. We made a big jacket for it. And we actually were like, yeah, we can do this. We can get it out on the cart. We bent the axles. And oh, no. So it was, the truck was fine, but the cart that we used to get it out of um, out of the field, yeah, we, we screwed that up pretty bad. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah, that's how it goes. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's kind of, there's that Indiana Jones aspect to field work. I, you yeah, know, just kind of adventuring and messing things up and figuring out solutions yeah it's it's a lot of fun and i mean it's it is very adventurous because you drive out to the middle of nowhere you, you gps where the truck is and then you hike mm -hmm. you just wander and you hope to find something and some days you find nothing some days you find you know tyrannosaur stuff coming out of the yeah. sandstone or, and you never know and it's very it's feast and famine and disappointment and reward but you know they're out there and you just have to find them just you just gotta catch them. Exactly. It is. It's just Pokemon with rocks. It's it's Pokemon with rocks. Yeah. And it, and once you get into it, once you can get used to the heat, it's addicting. It's just like mm -hmm. oh, I just want to go out there and find them. Yeah. Oh man, that's that's so much fun. Yeah. Well, most programs will take volunteers. They need as much help as they can get. So, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, next summer I think I'm probably I'm gonna apply for that internship. That sounds go super cool. I think. Um, Especially with, well, yeah, you definitely know the stuff. And so you have a heads up and uh, I would encourage you to go meet them. And I think you got a pretty good chance. Yeah. yeah. I'm this semester. I'm finally taking the paleontology class with Dr. Nice. Scheimer. With Grant? Yeah. 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 I love Grant. So excited. Yeah. That's a really fun class. I'm, I'm hyped. Yeah. I might be the TA for that. I don't know. We're all... I think I'm supposed to be. Oh, that'd be so. That would be so much fun. I think that would. I, that starts I, in like two weeks. <laughs> it does start really soon. I should probably talk to. Him. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Looks like. Let's go ahead with. Uh, let's have this be our last question for the okay. day. We've been going for a while. Uh, do you have any advice for aspiring paleontologists in high school, such as myself? I think this is going to yes. be kind of the, the one to end on. Yeah. Um. When I was at the end of high school. I thought paleontology was going to be a pipe dream and that I would work in geology and maybe get to do some work in paleontology if I got lucky. And then I just tried to make one connection and it paid off just like that. I, it, I can't say that it'll be that way for everybody, but um, as 
as long as you know your stuff, put yourself out there and you're willing to do the work because it is, I mean, so much of paleontology just looks so glamorous, but there is a lot of really hard physical work and really patient work involved with it. But as long as you're willing to do that and you're willing to put yourself out there and maybe even volunteer for a little while or just get to, um, just put yourself out there. Just try to make a connection, talk to people, email people, try to tour labs, try to meet the paleontologists at museums. Just put yourself out there. Even if you don't have perfect grades, I didn't. It just, it really pays off to try. Even just for a volunteer position or something, mm -hmm. once you have yourself out there and you're making those connections, that establishes everything. So yeah, just be willing to work hard and try to make those connections. I might, my laptop might die before the stream ends, so I'll be like 10 seconds. Oh, <laughs> I guess, I mean, it's fairly good timing as far as it goes. So yeah, honestly, this has been super fun stream, everybody. Uh, thanks, thanks for coming. We've had a, a ton of people. I think our peak viewership was like more than 20. So that's that's super, super good for one of these streams. Um, yeah, looks like Christ we've had some good. inspiring words. Oh, thanks, I'm considering becoming one. Thank you so much, man. Yes, it's interesting. Awesome. Yeah, looks like that was a, a really, really encouraging piece of advice. Lots of people are very excited about that. Yeah. Um, if you even just go to conferences and talk to people, as long as you're willing to put yourself out there, it can pay off. Yeah. Heck yeah. Yeah. Sounds like a plan, everybody. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you everybody for coming. Um, thank, thank you, you to for our having me. special guest star, John. That was super fun. Had a, really I, had, fun. I know I had a great time. <laughs> Yeah, I'd love to come back. Yeah, we can we can totally do this again sometime. That'd be a party. Awesome. Cool. All right. Peace out, everybody. Have a fantastic right. day and let's discover some dinosaurs. <laughs>